our next speaker is Dr. Harry Orr, who's a professor and the Tolak Chair in Genetics in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology, and also director of the Institute for Translational Neuroscience. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I do, and it involves research on a, uh, on a genetic neurodegenerative disease, but how did I get here? Well, you know, I was very interested in Sophia's talk because, like her, I grew up outside of Detroit in Michigan. I grew up in a suburb of Michigan called Birmingham. Uh, my dad and uncles on, his, on both sides of the family were all engineers and went to Purdue, and I thought, of course, I'm going to be an engineer. So through high school, I was taking physics, math, and all, and finally my senior year in high school, I had to take one more science class to graduate. So what was left? Biology. I loved it. And <laughs> to be honest with you, not only did I like it, it was easy for me. And I thought, well, geez, Harry, if you're going to spend the rest of your career doing something, shouldn't you be doing something you like and something that comes to you relatively easy? So from, from uh, a high school, I went to college. And it says here I went to Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan, which is correct. That's where I went. But my first year of college was at the University of Miami in Coral Gables, Florida. And I went there for three reasons. Uh, academically, I thought I wanted to be a marine biologist. And then, like you've heard previously, I really wanted to get as far away from home as I possibly could for a little while. And second of all, my senior year of high school, I had a really good time. And I sort of wanted to keep having a good time. In the University of Miami, besides being strong academically in certain areas, has other aspects to his reputation, shall we say, that fit with my plans for my. So in some ways, my freshman year of college was senior year of high school part two. After I finished up there, you know, University of Miami is a private school. I had to take out loans. And, and I, I decided, first of all, if I'm going to go to college, I better get an education. <laughs> And second of all, I didn't want to graduate with, with which would at that time been a, a relatively large debt. So that's why I went back to Michigan to Oakland University, got my bachelor's degree in science in, in biology. One of the really nice things about Oakland University is that it had several research labs supported by grants from NIH. So as an undergraduate, I could get into a research lab. And I found out I really liked biomedical research. I was still thinking of, of going into marine biology, so I spent a summer, um, you can see what 1971 was, it? anyway, that's quite a while ago, at the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology in Charleston, Oregon. And that experience further made me realize that I liked research in a lab, at that time, marine biology was very observational, and I liked manipulation of research in a lab. So my, my major message to you guys is get out there and do things and see what you like to do. One of the cool things about STEM is that there are a lot of different niches, a lot of different areas. So give yourself the advantage of finding out what you like to do and the way to do that is to get out and do things like this event. Um, spend a summer doing research somewhere. Anyway, so then my advisor in the research lab, Mike Riley, said, you know, there's this really cool graduate program at Wash U in St. Louis, Washington University in St. Louis, in neuroscience they're just starting up. Why don't you go do that? So off to St. Louis I went and um, had a great time in St. Louis, uh, a, a really good uh, uh, school to go to, and neuroscience program was great. And I found a lab to work in, and it was, had, had, had a great time. And from there, my PhD advisor said, you know, there's this new hot area in research called molecular biology. 
A former trainee of mine is at a, a Harvard University. So why don't you go there and learn molecular biology and DNA sequencing and all that stuff? So I did. And as a, but a part of that, I had to change disciplines from neuroscience to immunology. And again, trying different things uh, is, is, is really important as you, as you move through your, your career. You, in science, you never want to be afraid of trying something new. Because that's one of the cool things about being in science, is you keep getting to do new things. Um, so then, uh, uh, from Harvard, I, I came to the University of Minnesota. Oh, shoot, I put the date up there. As a faculty member, and joined the Department of Lab Medicine and Pathology as an immunologist. And literally, one day I was sitting in my office, and this neurologist came into my office and said, uh, uh, my family has this really interesting disease. It's called spinal cerebellar ataxia type 1. And it's a genetic disease, and the gene for it is located on chromosome 6 near the genes that you're working on to try to understand immunology, the HLA complex. So I literally went back to neuroscience, and that's what we do now is in the lab. Uh, my major duties are to be a research lab director, uh, uh, doing teaching and community outreach. But it, as you'll see in a moment, our research is, is focused on this, on this um, genetic disorder. Um, so are some of the things that I do outside the lab. Every year for the past 22 years, I've gone out to Utah on a raft trip. With this. So if you're all interested in, in seeing some really cool parts of the Southwest, uh, um, I'd be glad to, to, to give you some insights. One of the really interesting things about being a faculty member in research is you get to travel. My current mileage with Delta is over 2 million miles. And most of that, a lot of that, is traveling as a result of research, going to conferences, giving talks. Um, it, it, it is really something I did not anticipate. And then I've got grandsons and family in the area. And I think perhaps one thing you might notice from this slide is that here I am at high school in a coat and tie, and now here I am. And one of the nice things about being a professor is that you can kind of choose your wardrobe. And my favorite story is I was walking down the hall one day, and these two salespersons came up to me and said, is Dr. Orr in his office? And I looked at them both and said, no, he's not, and kept walking down the hall. <laughs> so um, it, anyway, OK. So why do I find? What I do, what am I supposed to be over with? Uh, 11.25. Okay, we're, we're going to get there. Um, why do I like what I do? First of all, as you've heard, the, you know, the, the brain is really a critical part of what makes us human. And one can kind of contemplate the idea of the brain understanding how itself works. That's, uh, it's one thing for the brain to understand how the kidney works. But to understand how itself works is, is, is an interesting. Why disease research? Well, it's an, it, to me, it's a very elegant way, if you will, of understanding function from dysfunction. And why a genetic cause? The reason why I'm attracted to a genetic disease is that there's a gene somewhere in the individual's DNA where there's a mutation that causes this disease. So there is something there to, be, to, to grab your hands on and, 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 and work with. And then what has become much more apparent to me over the years is point number two in terms of disease research. Is it a potential to positively impact the, the lives of others? And I can't tell you how rewarding it has been for me to come in contact with patients affected with the disease that we work on. So some bullet points. I already talked about the first one. Uh, uh, the disease is spinal cerebellar ataxia type 1, or SCA1. It's an autosomal dominant disease, which means 
you only need one of your two genes. You know, you have two copies of every one of your genes for the most part, one from your father and one from your mother. And you just, it's, it, you just need one of these copies to be mutated to get this the disease, which means one of the individual's parents have the disease. And it's located close to the HLA complex, which was this immunology story that I told you about. Patients are affected with motor and cognitive defi deficits. So it gives you a, 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 a spectrum, if you will, to try to understand how multiple aspects of the, of the disease, uh, uh, the gene works in terms of functioning of the nervous system. And what I found really intriguing was that in families with this disorder, the disease gets worse as the gene passes from generation to generation. And the major example we had was one father who was affected, it began to get the disease at age 35, and his son started getting it at age eight. So biologically, that, how does this happen? It was really interesting. Well, in genetic research, we like to talk about the circle of research because we start with patients. We start from, with families. It's from them that we get the DNA that we use to search for the affected gene and, and the mutation in that gene that causes the disease. So just a couple of pictures of individuals affected with SCA1 mid-course in their disease, and you can see the sort of classic wide stance to the individual on the left there. Uh, the fact that he's holding a cigarette has nothing to do with his disease. It's this wide classic, very classic cerebellar disorder. Um, and, and, and this is sort of a cl the movement aspects of the disease is, is, is a very important part. Identify the gene mutation. We identified the mutation. It's what's called an unstable repeat, and that's why the disease gets worse as it goes from generation to generation, is the mutation can get longer and longer, thus causing a worse and worse form of the disease. Over the years, we've used transgenic and various mouse models of this disease to try to understand in the lab what are the underlying mechanisms, what are the therapeutic uh, 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 targets, if you will, for, for this, this, this disease. And currently we are working with several pharmaceutical companies to do exactly that, is to come up with a treatment. So we're sort of work, we're three quarters to 80% of the way around this circle. Um, I want to talk a little bit briefly about who does what in neurological research. And PhDs, which is what I have, are, are play a major role in the basic aspects of the research, finding the gene, making the mouse models, doing the lab research. Translational means for us the transition from this basic research to the clinic. And as we move through this, th through this spectrum, now the MD and clinicians become much more important as we move back along that circle up to the patients and do clinical trials and so forth. Back to the point about finding your niche. The cool thing about the research team is that there are many places in which you can interject in this. You can have a bachelor's degree. You can have a master's degree. You can be a nurse, and a nursing degree, and so forth and so forth. So there are many places that you can interject yourself into this sort of spectrum. Um, and I will stop there and, and thank you. And if you have any questions, for those of you who don't, may not know, this is the view from my office, the football stadium. It's now named the Huntington Stadium. It, the reason why I find this kind of ironic, if you will, there's a disease called Huntington's disease, which is a member of the same type of diseases that I work on, these unstable repeats. Uh, Woody Guthrie, how many people in here know who Woody Guthrie is? This land in this Land is Your Land. He's written over 3,000 songs, I think. He died of Huntington's disease. And so it's, I've had some, I've been at meetings where I've met um, members of his family as, as well as, uh, I met Pete Seeger. Um, anyway, some, so you, I can see questions, yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, that's, that's actually, a, yeah. Um, are you thinking about going to graduate school? Yeah. Neuroscience, maybe? You should look into the University of Minnesota. And I think I just got a grant renewed for eight years, so, you know? Um, so, so typically in humans, this disease develops over 30 to 40 years. A mouse lives for two years. So one of the things we have to do is try to cram this disease course into a two-year lifetime. And one of the things we do is put in one, a really long version of the mutated gene, a very, so they're very severe. So it's, it's a model of the disease. You have to always keep that in mind. But yeah, we have to do things to enable to see the disease in, in, in the mouse in a short period of time. I'm sorry? Yes. Yes, yes. You got we're, they're called controls. Yeah. Any other questions? I think we're a little bit over time. You don't want Oh. Uh, so why did you begin to say that all of these things are like why begin to mention these things that are Yes. So, you know, I remember I, I told you I was dealing with marine biology and and, and there was also environmental sciences. And one of the research projects I did as, as an undergraduate in the teaching was expose tadpoles to DDT. And what ha one of the major effects of this uh, DDT on these tadpoles in, in, in our biology lab was that they develop abnormal movements. And I started to, to get, come, I came away with the idea that uh, 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 one of the major ways in environmental issues interact with humans is through the nervous system, and, and that's, that's what led me to, okay, I'll try neuroscience, so. But I cannot emphasize the breadth of, an, of opportunities that are out there in the STEM fields and how important it is just to get out there and try things. Find out what you like, and it's equally important to find out what you don't like. Good luck.